Program of Architecture and Art. Um, I'm co-chair of HTC Forum this semester, along with my colleague, Michelle De Silva, adjusting our lights. Um, and we'd very much like to thank the Lipstadt Stieber Fund for generously funding this lecture. HTC Forum allows the students in our program an opportunity to bring to campus those scholars we find intellectually compelling and challenging, scholars who we find ourselves returning to or discovering as we engage their scholarship in courses and our own research pursuits. Forum creates space and time for discussion within our department, just as it aims to engage the art and architectural communities in Boston and Cambridge. So our speaker tonight, Professor George Baird, is certainly no stranger to the Cambridge community. Uh, prior to his tenure as Dean in the Faculty of Architecture, Landscape and Design at the University of Toronto, Professor Baird was Professor of Architecture at the Graduate School of Design at Harvard University. He has published and lectured widely throughout most parts of the world, and his recent collection of 24 essays, um, entitled Writings on Architecture and the City, is both an accumulation and a fresh view into many decades of Baird's thought on the political and social status of urban public space, the role of planning in the built environment and critical architecture. And you know, conveniently, as you'll see here, we have copies at the front and the back for your perusal or purchase. Um, they're even on sale tonight. Um, so Professor Baird's prior publications include Meaning and Architecture, which he co-edited with Charles Jenks in 1969, and Q's Rendezvous Riots, which he co-edited with Mark Lewis in 1995. He is also author of a book on Alvar Alto, and a book entitled The Space of Appearance, as well as many other essays. Professor Baird's architecture and urban design firm, Baird Sampson Neuer Architects, is the winner of numerous design awards, and Baird is a fellow of the Royal Architectural Institute of Canada. He has been the recipient of the Toronto Arts Foundation's Architecture and Design Award in 1992, and the Da Vinci Medal of the Ontario Association of Artists in 2000. And tonight, oh sorry, I'm not done because we have somebody else up here with us tonight, which we're very excited about. Um, we have Professor Timothy Hyde joining us uh, up at the front. And Professor Hyde, as most of us know here, is currently Associate Professor in HTC at MIT. Professor Hyde's research focuses on intersections of art and politics, and he is currently pursuing an extended study of entanglements between architecture and law. Uh, research that includes his book, entitled Constitutional Modernism, Architecture and Civil Society in Cuba, 1933-1959. Um, his essay about uh, some evidence of libel, criticism, and publicity in the architectural career of Sir John Stone, uh, published in Perspecta, and a new project uh, on the aesthetic debates about ugliness in Great Britain in the 19th and 20th centuries, which he's currently teaching a seminar on here at MIT. So we very much look forward to the conversation tonight between Professor Baird and Professor Hyde, and we'll welcome uh, your questions after the talk. So please join me in welcoming them both here tonight. Thank you. Charles Jenks's little uh, blurb for the back of your book. I'm going to use that to 
Janice Gass going. We went to Charles Jenks and doing his little liner note for the back of this, this new volume on the writings on architecture in the city. He says, if I were to summarize George Baird's qualities in one phrase, it would be the philosophical architect. And I want to ask you about that, just your response to that and what it, what it signifies to him, but, but more to you, because obviously it's a striking phrase in first in that it's, it is the direct article, you're the philosophical architect, not a philosophical architect. Um, but also because we know at this point you, you, you could have expected any number of other uh, modifiers there, the theoretical architect to put you in the, the camp of the, of the, the theory crowd or the cardboard architects, um, because you've certainly produced your share of, of theory and architectural theorization. Um, uh, it could have said the practicing architect, because you are a practicing, you are a practitioner, and you've produced your share of uh, architectural objects and urban designs. Um, and it could have included uh, other dimensions, I suppose, of the, the philosophical, a philosophic sizing architect, or simply a, a writer and architect, which would be most common. So I'm curious initially whether you accept that, that particular designation as the philosophical architect, um, and what you think that signifies in, in making a distinction between uh, the, the, the theoretical armatures of architecture, the, the practical armatures of architecture, and what exactly is this kind of scope of philosophy of architecture? that you are apparently engaged in. Okay, I think I can um, probably say something um, in response to that. <clears throat> I, um, I went to architecture school as an undergraduate. Um, the graduate programs barely existed back in those days. Um, so I was in an undergraduate professional program at the University of Toronto, which is not that town. Um, 1957 and 1962, when I graduated. Uh, and I worked in Toronto for an interesting architect for a couple of years after I uh, had graduation. But I was restless. I was intellectually restless because um, I'm not going to try to capture the ethos of 1962 in, a, uh, in, a, in any length. But um, it, it, this is long before uh, the revival or uh, you know, new uh, resurgence of what we now know as architectural theory. Um, the, you know, the famous architects of the day were Paul Rudolph, Eros Sarn, and, and I am Pei. Um, and I, um, I was, I was unsatisfied and restless, and felt uh, insufficiently grounded intellectually. And it was on that basis that I decided to go back to school. Um, and I ended up, I unwittingly went to London um, to do so, largely because um, the British Commonwealth being what it was, it was easy to get funded for a Canadian to go to Britain. Um, and it wasn't so easy to get funded to go other places. So I could have come to the States. Everyone was going to Yale. All my peers were going to Yale to study under Rudolph, who was the dean at the time. But that was a, I was more interested in an intellectual project than Project anyway. So I went off. I went off to London, and, um, uh, and basically my life was transformed forever because I landed in. Uh, well, Michael A. says, and I think he's probably right that in the late '60s, architectural theory was in the process of being invented, and the two places where it was being invented were Venice and London. Um, and there I was in one of the two, without having had any idea that that was what I was coming to. So I, uh, in, um, I was, my thesis supervisor was a man called Robert Maxwell, who later became the dean at Princeton. Um, but the circle of uh, figures in which I moved were, included Joseph Rickward, Kenneth Frampton, Alan Cahoon, um, uh, Rainer Bannum, the, the one of them I didn't get along with, all the others I did get along with, um, E.H. Gombrick uh, was another one, um, uh, Robin Middleton, uh, with his this was the kind of thing. All of, and all of these people were you know, friends and neighbors in London, and I simply fell in with them. And it was an extraordinary experience. So it was, it was in my time in London that I discovered first French structuralism via the literary criticism of Roland Barthes and the uh, anthropology, structural anthropology of Claude Lévi-Strauss, not quite philosophy, but 
fairly kind of theorized uh, literary criticism and anthropology. Um, and then Joseph Rickward um, persuaded me to look at Maurice Merlo Ponti. Um, um, the other the other important figure that I discovered in London, strangely enough, given that she's an American, a German, Jewish American, but an American nonetheless, was the figure of Hannah Arendt. Um, I think Kenneth Frampton told me that he just that he was told about Hannah Arendt by an unknown member of the London group that most North Americans are familiar with called Sam Stevens, a very remarkable polymath. And I'm, I'm deducing that it must have been from Sam that I learned about Arendt as well, because I certainly didn't find her on my own. Now, Hannah Arendt is pretty close to being a philosopher, and sometimes she's not a political theorist, but you could call her a political philosopher, and she is, of course, a student, literally a student. She wrote a dissertation on her idea. So now we're really getting close to philosophy. So, um, and I, I actually became rather interested in phenomenological philosophy. And since I was in London, I, it, was, it was also impossible to avoid what philosophers call ordinary language philosophy, um, which is J.L. Austin and A.J. Ayer and a little bit um, Iris Murdoch, all these sort of Oxbridge types. I, I ended up really disliking ordinary language philosophy. And of course, they said it's a whole separate, it's a whole separate and opposed school of philosophy to continental philosophy, which is largely, not exclusively, largely phenomenological in its orientation, deriving from Husserl and Heidegger, um, so, um, and well, and I guess Carol Pinky comes out of that tradition as well. Um, so, and Charles Jenks and I had long discussions about all of this in relation to architecture. We were, um, we were both um, doctoral students together at the Bartlett School, him working with Peter Rubano and me working with Bob Maxwell. And we became close friends. And we, our first book, meaning an architecture book, as you've already indicated, is um, a co is a, a, a co-edited by the two of us. So, and, and, and those discussions continued all through the era of post-structuralism, so I, I have to say I couldn't call myself expert on Derrida or Deleuze and although I have made my efforts to read them, um, and, so, and I have successfully read some of their work. Um, I'm, not, I'm not a big fan of post-structuralism, and of course, since my interest in semiotics grew out of structuralism, which of course precedes post-structuralism, post obviously enough. Um, um, and I've always felt that the post-structuralist, you know, uh, Derrida's kind of scornful uh, attitude to Levi-Strauss has always struck me as um, like disingenuous, it's too strong. But it's kind of a bit juvenile and unnecessary, in my opinion. Um, and I don't have, my own view is that there's not a, well, not a huge ideological chasm between structuralism and post-structuralism anyway, but I won't get into that because it would be more detailed than is necessary here. But in any event, to make to come back to your question, I think Charles has got all that you know joint personal history in the back of his mind when he, when he makes that characterization. But it seems as far as it wouldn't apply to him, even though it has that same history. I mean, uh, at least I wouldn't well, although, I see it as, as well, such a, a, an apt fit. I mean, and, and I guess the reason I say that is that it was some, something that's conveyed in it as well as a certain kind of, I'd say, temperance of thought, not moderation of thought, because I don't consider you a moderate architectural thinker um, by any means, but a sort of temperance of thought that, that Jenks doesn't have, where I would place him more, be, be more quick to describe him as an architect and writer or as, a, as, a, as an architectural theorist. Um, would be because of a kind of insistence of uh, argumentation as opposed to an unfolding of argumentation. I think what I'm, what I'm referring to is in the, in the, even if you just read these 24 essays, there's a kind of um, uh, 
uh, a reasonableness of the unfolding of arguments within them. So that kind of um, uh, uh, a movement back and forth between positions. It comes also, I think, from a very English school of thinking and um, an English school of writing as well. But it strikes me as philosophical in that it seems to move back and forth between modes of observation and modes of rationation. So that there's a kind of a, an appeal to the rational and to the layers of the rational and then a movement into observation, whether it's the observation of the, the sort of tangible facts of reality or observation of, of politics and the political theory that's in the references to Arendt. So it's the movement back and forth between those that, that uh, and the process of, of writing about architecture by moving between the modes of observation and rationation that seems to me to be a good fit to the, the phrasing of the philosophical architect as distinct from Jenks, who, who seems to me to be less even handed in those, in moving back and forth between those categories. Well, I, I probably would disagree with what you just said. But, but I mean, what, I, just one small caveat about Charles, and that is, you know, there's a very interesting, I can't remember, there's somewhere, one of the essays, one of the interviews, middle period interviews with Rem Kulhaus, um, uh, well, Rem and Charles were friends, and have been friends since I first met at the AA, when Rem was a student at the AA, um, and their friendship has survived to this day. Um, and there's an essay that Kulhaus, Published some, I'm not going to remember this precise reference, but in which Rang talks about a period of time when he was spending um, parts of summers on Cape Cod. Charles still has a, Charles is from New England, went to Harvard, his, his first degree is from Harvard, and his family had a, a summer place on Cape Cod, and Charles still has it. And he, he, even though he now lives in London, he has, he has a tradition of coming to Cape Cod for part of the summer. And on, on more than one occasion, Ram came with him. And he, in this interview, Cool has talked so, and there was an episode um, after the period that I was with, together with Charles and Evan, when his first marriage broke up. And he was, um, uh, you know, emotionally hurt by that. And so Kulhas talks about them spending holidays together at Cape Cod, where he would commiserate with Charles about the end of his marriage. And Charles would reciprocate by explaining French philosophy to him. <laughs> <laughs> and so Rem credits his understanding of post-structuralism to Charles James. So, so with that caveat, I don't disagree with your characterization. And he might not disagree with that either, actually. It's, it's probably why he's calling me the philosophical architect. Right, it could be an insult, for all we know. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> but I mean, to carry forward the, 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 kind of this, the proposition that your thinking moves back and forth between observation and sort of rationation, I think um, this becomes evident to me anyway in the, in the way that you're moving through this much longer story about the, the evolving public sphere, the evolving, let's say, publicness of architecture. And here, just to continue the, with distinctions, I think, where, where I would see Jenks is, is offering very kind of acute recognitions of, of evolutions within architectural discourse. Um, the recognition of the sort of um, evolution of the larger surround, social surrounds of architecture, seems less of a, of a key concern to him than, than it is to you. And, and so, as a, as, a, as, a, really as a fundamental point, a fundamental question, I'm curious to know what the, what would be the, your current recognition of this inevitable publicness of architecture, if you think of it as, um, as having arrived, or having now occurred at the end of a much larger, a much larger arc, a much larger arc within your career, uh, in which we move from a, a kind of presence of publicness in architecture as something much more definite, something much more um, recognizable, something much more legible to our contemporary moment where, where the inevitable publicness of architecture may still be present, but where publicness itself is, is, is perhaps less 
uh, less certain. And what I'm thinking, just to, to try to be more clear about this, is that if, if I, as I read the essays um, from the late 60s onward into the, the most recent ones, you're moving from a setting where the publicness of architecture was occurring, for example, at a moment and in a place where there was still a public commons guaranteed by the existence of a welfare state, by the existence of a public apparatus, that now has um, all but vanished into a sphere of kind of privatization. You were speaking in a moment where public communication took place um, in, uh, in great distinction from private communication. Uh, and very different from our contemporary moment where private communication is now manifestly public, whether whether in the conspiracy theory world or the conspiracy conspiratorial realities of Edward Snowden. But I'm thinking more of social media, simply the right. projection of a kind of private life into the public. Um, or even in a, if we think of the contrast from the late 60s, um, where the, the first emergence of the of the, the actual uh, frailty of some consolidated sense of cultural identity became apparent and that, that has now evolved from our present moment into the, the sheer violence of cultural difference, right? That's now happening globally. So it seems that there, if we think of the public side of things, the, 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 the public sphere itself, that there is a, a strong evolution away from the, the characteristic publicness in which your thought, your saying, was formed into a very different inchoate condition um, where publicness itself is in some ways in doubt. And so I'm curious to, to hear um, how or in what way you conceive of this inevitable publicness of architecture operating today, where previously you were able to establish a boundary of public to private and then argue that architecture inevitably moved across that boundary, that, that, it, was a, uh, that it existed at that boundary. What are the conditions today where that boundary itself is so much more difficult to actually identify? Whether we think of social media, cultural difference, um, privatized governments, and states, and so forth. Well, that's a large question. I, um, how shall I answer that? Um, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn, turn it back on you is what I'm gonna give you because I would suggest there, there are two ways in which what, you, what you've just said is not wrong, but has a problematic, um, well, uh, problematic uh, emphasis. And that is, I would accuse you of um, uh, slightly romanticizing the, the condition you characterize as the prior one. Um, you know, I mean, there's this, you know, if you talk about political theory, you know, there are two, there are two foundational books about publicness. One is our Anna Arendt's book, The Human Condition, and the other one is Jürgen Habermas's book, The Structural Transformation of the Public Sphere. I mean, two of two, I really got the discourse about the public going in the late 1950s. And, you know, Habermas's book, uh, kind of suggests that the golden age was like the late 18th and early 19th century, and that it's been, been downhill ever since. Or, um, and Arendt, of course, laments what she calls the rise of the social, which she sees as kind of sort of eroding the essential dignity of publicness. Um, um, but that having been said, um, you know, in her first book, The Origins of Totalitarianism, uh, Arendt, um, that's the book in which she kind of makes the kind of her original argument, or one of her original arguments in that book, is that Nazism and Stalinism actually have more in common than they have um, differentiating them um, um, on account of, um, and have, have, having to do with their totalitarian characteristics. And she basically um, argued that. Um, that public, public, publicness was you know, barely existed in, in the Stalinist Soviet Union uh, because of the kind of you know, comprehensiveness of government control of human, uh, human uh, the activity of the Soviet population. And 
and she was, so she was, um, she was very caught off guard when these German workers were voted against the Ulrich government in uh, 1953. And then she was even more caught off guard when the Hungarian students were voted against the, the puppet, puppet government of Hungary in 1956. Um, um, because according to her argument about totalitarianism, those such rebellions weren't supposed to be possible. I mean, they were precluded by the totalitarian system she thought she had characterized so precisely. And she, um, and then of course the next thing that happens is the student activism in, you know, in, in North America, and well not only in North America, in Europe too, in relation to opposition to the Vietnam War, um, all, the, all, of, all the sort of um, activist phenomena we associate with the events leading up to 1968. Well, all of that um, exhilarated her and caused her to reconsider her position and to decide that while things were maybe not great, they were actually not as bad as she had thought they were. And that um, action, which for her is the kind of quintessence of politics, action had not been precluded either by the social in the Western world or by the totalitarianism in the Eastern Bloc after all, even though she had thought it had done so. So I, I tend to have a similar, I mean, I do not, to, to come to the second half of your um, proposition, proposition you tabled, I mean, I do not deny that all those different modalities of um, you know, mutated social discourse, I guess we could call them, exist and that they do make difference. I, I, I not to mind that. But I might quarrel with the degree to which they, my, I mean, I remember this first starting with the virtual, remember? When, yep. You know, the, all the kind of you know, eager beavers of the virtual explained that, you know, soon the reality wouldn't matter anymore because we were all going to exist in virtual reality. Well, yeah, sure. I mean, what, what turned out to be interesting was that vir vir virtuality as a kind of uh, uh, amplification around the edges of what we had hitherto known as reality turned out to be interesting and provocative, but I don't think it fundamentally altered what we had hitherto known as reality. So I would take a, a kind of similar position. And that's not to say that there aren't changes or that there aren't problems, because I but I don't think they, uh, I, I would be inclined not to see them running as deep as your commentary would suggest. Well, if I cast them to not as problems, but maybe in a more observational mode, the other way that I would propose looking at it is not, not so much the, um, the, the transformations of the publicness of the public sphere and its qualities, although we guess we agree that those transformations have taken place, but to ask about the, the relationship of architecture to a private sphere. So where in this earlier period it seemed still possible to think cogently about what an architecture of the private sphere was, whether it was to actually produce studio projects around individuals or whether it was out in the world to think uh, that the, the single family house design still had a, a, resonant, um, a resonant kind of architectural consequence or importance. Uh, I would speculate that that's much less the case now, that it's, that it's actually hard to think of architecture as having some bearing on the private sphere, that, that the developments in architectural discourse as they, as they move ahead, as they transform, as they pose questions, uh, have less and less to do with that, with that private sphere. So that if your earlier thinking depended upon a kind of ability of architecture to, to move back and forth, that the risk now, or the difficulty now, would be that there isn't much there isn't much to be thought about uh, in the private realm of architecture. I would defer to, to Anna to think about this, or to talk about this in terms of the Eastern European context, asking you know, whether at this earlier moment the private individuals who so surprised Aaron um, also had already a kind of concrete sense of the architecture uh, that encompassed them as having some intimacy, some individuality, some sort of uh, address to them as, as individual agents rather than 
that historical note aside, um, I guess the, the, the provocation I put to you is simply that the that the that architecture is now fully public, and that there its discourse doesn't have anything to do with the private realm of individuality or uh, singular subjectivity. Expected this to be quite this argumentative. I'm a bit surprised. Um, but maybe, I mean, there's, I mean, again, partly what you say has resonance for me, but the way in which it has resonance has to do with a kind of um, uh, a flattened out characterization of architecture which would revolve around. Um, you know, the star system and manipulated digital photography of buildings and wallpaper magazine and, um, uh, you know, Daniel Lewiskin's leopard skin boots. Um, a kind of um, uh, a character, a characterization of architecture which for my money, these are three quarters of it. I mean, I, 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 I don't want to reduce architecture to a, a sociological exercise, as you know, like what, what happened to some schools like Berkeley and Michigan in the, in, in the wake of the '68 defense, where you know design went out the window as a kind of tyrannical uh, oppression of the people by an elite or something like that. I'm not, I'm not arguing that kind of posture about, about the social role of architecture. But I do think, I do see architecture as a, a social and political praxis, which includes you know, fast food joints and shopping malls and um, suburbs and, um, and employment lands and um, you know, all the kind of uh, organizational apparatuses that Michael Martin talks about. I mean, for me, it's all, it's all um, um, architecture, at least it's all architects, are all putatively architecture, at least even if it doesn't quite make it as architecture uh, in a larger sense. And the, the, the project of architecture, and so, and you know, and I'm also, the, uh, another way of maybe characterizing this is just, you know, use the, the phrase from Walter Benjamin, which I, I don't want to just, um, can not, it just sort of turns up in my thinking with disconcerting frequency. Architecture is the prototype of a work of art which is appropriated by a collectivity in a state of distraction. I mean, it's the famous phrase of Benjamin, and um, um, you know, which I translate, I, I mean, there are, there are what I call fancy high left interpretations of that statement which want to talk about the alienation and the, you know, Impression of the working class, etc., etc., etc. But I mean, I'm, I'm just taking this. I'm prepared to. I'm not, and I'm not saying that's irrelevant. But I'm just prepared to take the statement as meaning that most of us, most of the time, do not pay conscious attention to the tectonic world that surrounds us in our daily life. So architecture has this. Um, uh, it, 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 it starts in this quotidian role of just containing. In an activity, um, and then it, um, and our relationship to it can go all the way from um, from that that simple kind of taking for granted, which, by the way, you know, taking for granted is a kind of Heideggerian construct about you know how we how being in the world works, um, all the way through to you know the, the opposite of distraction, for which we mentioned is concentration which he characterizes as you know, what you do in front of a painting that you admire in an art gallery. Um, and I'm not and I, I'm not saying that we don't concentrate on the buildings and obviously um, architects when they're visiting other architects' buildings do concentrate on them and you know look at them carefully and try to decide what they think of them. But but that's uh, that's not the way we operate most of the time. That's a kind of Exceptional, and you know, if you try to be concentrating on the architecture all the time, I mean, you know, in a 
few hours you have a nervous breakdown, all right, from just kind of the stress of uh, that sustained kind of attention. So I, so for me, the spectrum socially and politically includes pretty much the world. And the spectrum in terms of consciousness goes from that which is just completely taken for granted all the way through to that which we sort of, you know, on particular occasions regard with awe and admiration. So, so in, and in that sense then, I, um, um, I agree that the kind of, um, the, that there is a version of the architectural discourse which is kind of shrunken. But I just want to, um, I just want to say, well, uh, you know, for me it's not, it doesn't reduce to that. Well, and I think that, that uh, I would want to ask now that there, there, um, there are several aspects in your thinking that actually point the way towards enlarging or re-enlarging that, that discourse. Um, before, before I ask about that, though, I just want to say, so it's on the record, that you really have to write the essay titled Daniel Liebeskin's Leopard Skin. It's <laughs> in that essay. Um, it's important that that appear in the library somewhere. Um, the, the notion of a, or the kind of the appearance of, of architecture as something encountered in, in the state of distraction or in, uh, in a state of kind of momentary recognition, fleeting recognition, um, I think is, uh, is clearly evident in several points of, of the way that you argue and think and write about architecture. Um, and there are two in particular that were, that were important to me in, in reading through the book and then in offering suggestions to, to some of the PhD students on, on how, what essays to read to enter into the book. So I want to highlight those um, to ask you about uh, the possibility that they point towards this kind of a, a margin or, or recuperating or creation of a certain terrain that maybe architecture has, has withdrawn from. The two that I'm thinking of are, uh, first, you write about the work of Machado Sabetti, and I included that essay, though it may seem, I don't know if it seemed tangential or if it seemed kind of um, oblique in the context of the larger argument. I included that one because what, uh, what I found so striking in it was the, the, the recognition of the deciphering of the drawings, the drawings of the plazas, rather than actually the plazas themselves, but the drawings of the plazas as actually pointing towards an architecture that could uh, produce a very subtle relationship between the, the structural and formal sense, the structural and informal sense arrangements of urban space and the subjective or phenomenological ones. And in particular, it's understanding in the plans the, the revelation of section, the revelation of third dimension uh, in the shadowing of certain elements, the use of shading. So the drawings themselves are um, are pointing towards themselves as productions of inhabited spaces that will be inhabited, as you say in the essay, in a, potentially in a state of distraction, in a state of, uh, that, that carries along with it momentary recognition of topography, a momentary recognition of a reorganization of a site, um, but without any of the assumption that the architecture will have uh, a concentrated, an audience that is concentrated, right? That these clauses will not be encountered by, by that, by that by that reader or viewer. Um, so the, the careful study there of the, of the drawing itself, of this, um, of this obviously deeply embedded element of architectural practice, um, is, is something that's actually opening up this possibility of, a, of, a, of an architecture that does not demand attention, but that solicits a kind of uh, engagement nevertheless. Um, the second example will be in the, um, uh, in the essay considering questions of agency within the contemporary city and the, the agent um, particularly of the user of space within the arrival city. But maybe I'll, I'll uh, parse the question, uh, divide it in half and just ask, first with regard to the drawing, is there, what is your sense or what, uh, as you look at the University of Toronto, as you look at other schools, as you look at contemporary practice, um, what, are, what are the modes of representation, the modes of of revealing architecture through drawing, through video, through animation, through modeling, and so forth, um, that may that are still capable of producing the kind of nuance that you saw in the Machado and Sabetti drawings. Is this still part of 
a key part of architectural representation to actually solicit an audience that is not that is a distracted audience rather than a concentrated one. Well, it's, uh, I mean, I do. By the way, let me let me start by saying that I think you know now we're not arguing. I I I, 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 I concur with I concur with and admire your characterization of my reading of the Machado and Silvetti um, designs and, and, and of the drawings, I think, uh, that you, you got it as I intended it. Um, so, so that's for a start. And, but of course that, um, you know, that, that piece is a kind of period piece now, as you, you can say that, which is really implicit in your, in your second comment. Um, and even they would probably operate in that way now. And of course, it's kind of poignant that, and this goes back to your, you know, remark about the privatized world. Um, I was like, when Tim took, uh, I taught a seminar on Tafuri uh, at the GSD, which Tim attended. And basically, what we did was we looked at the introductions to all. Uh, all we did with the course was to look at the introductions to all of Tafuri's books from the, uh, that were translated. So we didn't even go into the main body of any of the books. We just kind of mapped the ideological thrust of the introductions from book to book to book to book. Um, so I, and in the process of which I grew very fond of Tofuri's uh, propensity to start sentences with the phrase, it is no coincidence that. <laughs> um, um, and so uh, now I can say it is no coincidence that none of Machado and Silvetti's public space designs got implemented because the, um, um, the public world that we pay for them uh, you know, didn't materialize. So, I mean, which does suggest that what you're arguing, you know, one discussion back is you know, has some substance to it. Um, but um, uh, as for the, the, the uh, modes of representation now. Um, well, first of all, students don't draw as much as they should. One, I think one of Barney Silvetti's best introduction in, in, in innovations in the curriculum of the architecture program at the GSD when he became the chair was to so assertively reintroduce um, um, hand drawing, not because he was expecting draw presentation drawings or any old fashioned stuff like that, but only that the, the, the sketching is a kind of practice and you can, I don't think you can, save for some digital methodological explorations, you can't conceive a project on a computer. I mean, you can develop a project on a computer, but you can't conceive it. So I, I do actually think that there's still a role for, for drawing. Um, and then I guess, and then of course the computer is such a formidable tool, especially when it comes to representation, that it, um, it bespeaks a certain, I mean, I find the most interesting students, the most interesting approaches to representation on the part of students nowadays have to do with what they choose to do without, like, doing all the, doing the renderings in monochrome, as chewing the color would be one. Uh, option or um, or um, uh, certain kind of modalities of stylization, so as to because the the, the option of a sort of um, kind of fruit salad like uh, collage representation of reality with um, elements just appropriated from every you know, possible source is so easy now that it um, it constitutes a sort of is too strong a word, but a kind of disingenuousness, I think. Uh, uh, you know, an, an image which you know, has no hope of manifesting authenticity. So I, I think there's an issue there, and it, it has to do, uh, I mean, I guess, I mean, the best I can offer off the top of my head is that it has something to do with restraint and um, editorial control. So paradoxically, that restraint would actually be a way of recuperating a certain I think so. prior I think so. in a way that the uh, 
that's been eroded by the kind of the flood or infusion of realism, yeah. of, a, of, a, of a putative realism in the collage genre. The, the second part of the, the question of the duration would deal with, with agency. And, and so in the, in the essay on agency, when you're pointing um, to, the, to the facts of the arrival city, and the, the thinking of the arrival city, uh, and then its relationship, or as we extend it into questions of the urban law, it seems there that the, there, there is the, uh, a recognition, uh, a kind of demonstration of the, the agency of individual subjects, private subjects, whether in the informal sense of the rival city or in the more formalized, yet kind of chaotic still structure of Tokyo. Um, so that would seem also to be a location in which we'd be able to, to, to redress somehow this, uh, what I'm describing as the loss of the, the relevance between architecture, the resonance between architecture and the private sphere. But I'm, but I'm, I'm not entirely clear how that would happen, that, uh, in the sense that if this is an agency that is being, uh, well, do you see this as an agency that is in fact lying somewhat outside of or on the periphery of architecture, professionally, architecture discursively, in the sense that these are not clients or these are not um, these are not settings that are demanding, summoning, and soliciting architecture. Is this is this an architecture? Is this an area from which an area of private life, private development, private um, action, uh, from which architecture is being excluded uh, because of the informality, the production of the informal, the informal um, or through the, the kind of strong limitations of these these property ownership structures in Tokyo, or is this a kind of, is, are you thinking or beginning to identify a certain kind of agency, a certain kind of action that architecture can establish some new relationship to, some new conversation with? Um, well, maybe some of, some of each, I would say, I mean, uh, uh, let me, I guess I would have two things to say about that. I, in the same way that I think that, that everything is an architecture, but everything putatively could be architecture, or at least that we can take the whole ter ter territory of the fabricated world as uh, available to us with which to um, at first understand and second work. Um, and I think the informal settlements are. Uh, uh, are an instructive lesson for architects in how to um, how to um, how to be creative in circumstances of fairly acute exigency. Um, um, so that would, so at least as an analog or, or as an exemplar, if not as architecture itself. Um, and then, um, it, to, if you go to Tokyo, it might be worth my saying a little bit. I've written, I, I went back to Japan in the spring, and, uh, and I've been doing my reading on Japan, and I now understand um, how Lau's um, uh, interpretation of the urban farm of Tokyo more clearly than I did in, when I wrote the essay that's in the book. And um, uh, Sukamoto, Argues that the, the uh, land, urban land in Tokyo, is extraordinarily um, widely distributed among a large, a very, very large number of very small land owners. I mean, he calls it a kind of city, a city. A, he describes it as a city of houses. Um, it's not all houses, but it is still a big city, of more than 35 million. And uh, an astonishing amount of the territory of Tokyo is houses, houses, individual houses on lots. It's just astonishing. Um, and he sees that it's a kind of whole history of how land tenure and how uh, uh, Japanese families prefer to subdivide their land to pass it on to their children um, because. Um, and they do that before they die because then the inheritance taxes are reduced. So there's a, there are a whole set of 
um, circumstances in Japanese law and society that kind of produced this proliferation of small parcels of land, which are in, um, uh, I, I have relatively small buildings uh, built on them. Um, and sometimes look, there's this phenomenon that I speak about briefly in the essay called the pencil building, which is a relatively tall building, eight or ten or fifteen stories, which is on a on the, the lot of what was a single house. So they're extraordinarily small footprint buildings. But what this what what this means is that it's um, again it means you've got small landowners and it's a kind of sort of mini developer system. I mean they're not you know you, know, you don't have to be um, the Rose Corporation in order to build one of these. All right, I mean. Um, uh, there, uh, you know, an ordinary person couldn't do it, but a person of modest means or a family could do it because it's a, it's a feasible socioeconomic undertaking. So this produces a very interesting um, um, uh, social, social and political model that I think, and I think it, it actually so it, it, it kind of manifests agency on the on the part of the the migrant, you know, building his or her own shack uh, to and, uh, and and of course one of the one of the things that Saunders points out in that remarkable book, Doug Saunders, by the way, is a very important writer, and he's not known in the States because he's a journalist rather than an academic. But his book on arrival city is, I mean, I think it's the most important book on informal settlements, or at least the politics of informal settlements that I know. And he he actually thinks that these settlements are uh, a social political triumph of our time that you know with all their difficulties and their difficulties are innumerable they the, the people who are in them are in a better situation than they were before they got there and they are there because they knew that it would be better um, and they're um, they're full of uh, economic enterprise um, and uh, it, they're just an extraordinary phenomenon and as i said it, in many cities of the world, they are the, the larger portion of the actual urban fabric of, this, of, the, of, this, of the city itself. So, so they, um, they have this incredibly important role. And if you, if you kind of bridge from the person building the corrugated metal um, uh, enclosure for themselves through to the Japanese family building the 10-story small apartment building, I mean, you are seeing um, agency in play. Now, at what point um, architecture kicks in in that process? I mean, I agree that's a question, and it's certainly not all happening throughout. Um, but I mean, but Bow Wow, I mean, it, it, it seems to me you could, most, most of Bow Wow's um, design production is houses. And I actually came to the conclusion that they, um, um, well, for a series of historical reasons, they're actually trying to reinvent the Japanese house. So, you know, the, the, Japan, the historical Japanese house was always made of wood. They tended to burn down at the you know, dropping of a candle. Um, and then, of course, the world, the, the second, you know, the, the, the damage that uh, uh, Japanese cities sustained in the second, the second World War, not just Hiroshima and Nagasaki. But all, almost all the other major Japanese cities were fond firebombed beyond recognition. So, you, so Japan at the end of the Second World War is kind of like a tabula rasa. Uh, and so basically the Japanese had to challenge uh, the, the war, the problem of fires, earth, and of course earthquakes. They have earthquakes, and earthquakes also cause fires. Um, uh, it, basically, they had to reinvent they had to reinvent the house. And, uh, um, and, and unlike most of his, their contem Japanese contemporaries, the um, um, Kojima and Tsukamoto are interested in the, not the absolutely basic house, but the relatively modest house, and most of their architectural projects are such. So I, I, I sort of see the architecture sort of appearing in Sometimes it appears, sometimes it doesn't appear in that kind of array of social and political circumstances, but I see it as a very pregnant and um, fertile territory of possibility. 
what seems like you're also willing to to find the the to allow agency to appear at at, at different moments within or encounter architecture in, in different ways in in um, in different stages of the process of some urban formation coming into being, so that you're not assuming that architecture has to be the prior agent, has to actually be the motivating factor that actually um, uh, intervene or engage even, uh, at, at different moments, so that the initiating action may be individuals, the, the inhabitants of the arrival city, the initiating action may be, may be architectural, it may be the child of these dogs. You know, as you say, these weren't realized, but nevertheless, they did produce some private subjectivity right. in the drawings themselves, right? And, and it's, a, it's something that could be known and deciphered and read, as you demonstrated. So in that case, architecture may be the initiating action in the region. Um, in other cases, it may be deferred and be following from some other kind of agency. Um, I do want to bring the rest of your audience uh, in with their, their questions. I would like to say one more thing about Japan. I mean, I'm happy to do that, but uh, so I would like to open it up to the audience. But just say one more thing about Japan, and that was um, I gave an early version of this more amplified talk about Japan in Vancouver last week, and um, there was an interesting question in the audience about the fact that the traditional Japanese house doesn't have any corridors. Um, and there's a kind of, there's a, it's the, it goes back to the question of privacy. And, and by the way, one of Bao Wow's objectives is to bring strangers back into the house. They've actually said that that's, um, because they think that the, the Japanese, the, the, the contemporary Japanese house has become too much of a kind of sealed container that uh, has no relation to the public world. And they're, they, for example, wrap Toyo uh, Tadao Ando's knuckles for house designs which are sort of totally mute in the public realm. Um, uh, and that, and so you can, so, so if you see them wanting to bring strangers back into the house and you understand that the historical house didn't have any corridors, then it actually kind of qualifies what one thinks was, what was understood to be privacy in the, in, in, the, in the intimate world in the first place. And it actually, from the first era, I was sitting in the auditorium in Vancouver, and all of a sudden I thought of Robin Evans' famous essay, Figures, Doors, Passages, in which he explained how it's only in the late 17th century in Britain that the corridor comes to exist in Anglo-Saxon architecture, because up until then, the rooms were all filad, um, just like Versailles, and you had to, everyone had to go through every room to get to the next one, so that the, the corridor as a kind of bypass circulation technique um, is a kind of uh, operational invention of the, uh, of the bourgeois period. So um, anyway, so I, and then you suddenly think that, um, and so, they, so Bao Bao thinks that the current Japanese house is too private, and, um, and, I, and then it occurred to me, you know, Japan does have one of the highest suicide rates in the world. I mean, it's, it occurred to me. I mean, there are, um, this is very uh, 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 consequential stuff they're talking about here, actually. You know, just arising out of these kind of things. So anyway, so I'll just put just a footnote to what I said before. Um, no. Solicit the, the questions. I think that that phrasing, just to underline it, of bringing strangers back into the house, that's very, that's very intriguing, kind of revelatory to me, because it's not then the this um, the opposition of the public, private, the public, and so on. Um, while it remains a, a distinction, rather than trying to understand what architecture seeks to achieve as a kind of smoothing, as a kind of bringing the private out into the public. Um, it actually is able to maintain or uh, produce an idea that's, that's um, in some ways more conflicted, that, that rather than the Habermasian communicative reason of this, of this space of consensus, um, where we as private individuals move through architecture out into a, an agreed and consensual public, that, um, that this is a more intrusive process of yeah. the stranger in the house. And not that that needs to be a hostile process, and, and we would look then back into the long architecture particularly you know, kind of broadly uh, and more expansive 
geographical survey, look at this long tradition of receiving the visitor, receiving the stranger within the house, not the friend, not the known acquaintance, and so on, which would be an interesting, uh, perhaps recalibrating uh, for, for me, anyway, of what I was arguing earlier about the, the, the role of architecture more private. It would no longer be the protective private, but rather the uh, architecture, while I still think it, it has no relevance for the private in the contemporary moment, um, it could by actually being the architecture of the stranger rather than uh, simply trying to, to re rebuild the individual subject and move him or her outward to the public. Um, but in any case, if there are comments or questions, we can start to, to host from the, um, uh, from the floor that's also material to dig into. I can let you have your say on the microphone. <laughs> Certainly a lesson for 
planners, and that is that the way in which they, um, the buildings grow incrementally, to character, typically grow incrementally. So it starts with a shack, then the shack gets, gets actual, even a masonry walls. It may still have a corrugated metal roof, but it has unit masonry walls. And then, um, assuming that the family is actually making a social and economic headway, which is often, the, most often the case, not every, they don't all, but most often the case, they, it's not uncommon for them to acquire a second floor. And then, you know, if, if, you, if you look at a kind of mature informal settlement, you will find that the people have even become, the people have even become their individual plots have become landlords, all right? So they have, they have a, they, they live in part of the building and they rent part of the building, so they actually have income um, from part of the building. Um, so, um, so the, um, the kind of, the implications for kind of the evolution of urban form are, oh, and, and then of course that raises the whole question of the security of tenure and what it, what it means to own or not own land and how you borrow money if you don't own land, etc. Cetera, et cetera. So it's a, it's a very, very interesting thing. Hi. Uh, probably my question comes from a more personal uh, place. But as a practitioner, an architectural practitioner, and someone who's also interested in theory and the intellectual project, what do you think being an architect brings to the other side of the coin? And what do you think being an intellectual and too interested in theory brings to the architecture your own practice, I guess. Like, what is the method? I know um, some say you have to choose one side of the coin or the other. Um, and how do you feel like being a practicing architect brings something to the table? Well, that's uh, uh, well, this is maybe an indirect way of answering your question, but the first generation of uh, people who got interested in architectural theory, like me, from the late 60s, were almost all practicing architects. Then, um, you know, as structuralism gets superseded by post-structuralism, the, the second generation of people interested in um, uh, theory um, were mostly just academics. They weren't practitioners. And then, the third generation, a lot of them weren't even architects, weren't even trained as architects. I mean, um, uh, Michael Speaks, Mark, is Mark Wiggum trained as an architect? I don't think so. He's an undergrad. I'm okay. Um, and then, um, who are the two, uh, this is embarrassing, the two women who were in Iowa? Catherine um, Ingram. This one. Not Dana Cuff. Um, sorry? Uh, Jennifer Blue. Jennifer Blue. Yes, 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 yes. Um, and then Bob Sommel's another one, you know, people who aren't architects at all. So, so you know, there was a period when it was during the time I was at, at, on the faculty of the GSD where Jorge Silvetti got very grumpy about architectural theory because as far as he could see, it, it didn't have much to do with architecture anymore. So, and so, so, so I think the kind of the, I mean, the link back to practice acts as a kind of grounding, which um, you know keeps the theoretical speculation from becoming completely deracinated. Uh, I would say. So that's the the practitioner side of it. Um, uh, as for the other, I guess the what what the intellectual side of it brings is just. Knowing what, knowing what you're, actually knowing what you're doing, and not only that, actually knowing why you were doing it. Um, that's what I think, why I think um, ideological demystification is so interesting, because, and I, I must, you know, we've all had this happen. You, su you suddenly have an embarrassing moment when you realize, oh my gosh, I used to think X, and all of a sudden something has happened that is revealed to me Two things. First of all, it's revealed to me why it is that I thought that. And secondly, that it was wrong to think that. It was actually wrong. And so you have a little epiphany, all right, where you suddenly um, understand something about yourself and the world that you didn't previously do. 
and you and you mean intellectual veracity or to your summation in order to be able to do that. I can just ask a in a way a follow up to Justin's question and, and to your answer um, and ask about the um, well history and the kind of writing of history in relationship to theory and practice and um, but more specifically the form of writing history and the contrast between essay, the kind of historical moment, you know, contribution to the historical moment in the essay, um, the the historic this professional historical monograph that seems to be the current um, currency, uh, versus then the, the the longer, more synthetic history that I, I always think of as having accompanied this initiatory moment of theory, as I'm thinking of Rickworks writing in particular, Middleton also, Paris Gomez, you know, these books that are that are dealing with several centuries of architectural thought and attempting to synthesize or precipitate out of them uh, some legible arc, some legible movement from, from one place, one pre-enlightenment place to, to some subsequent place. But those seem not only out of vogue, but, but difficult to write. <laughs> Um, but they, well, they might be too easy to write, maybe that's the problem. Um, that, that they no longer seem to say what they would need to say. And in their place, we have, uh, we have architectural monographs, things we recognize. Um, and, and, and historical essays, although those too seem to be disappearing, and I'm thinking more of Alan Colton you know, being a kind of practitioner of that, of the essay that, that's deeply historical, but is still depends on the essay form, or Colin Rowe. Um, and since you've done both essays, as we've seen, but also um, the, the monographic work, um, uh, the space of appearance, and um, I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on this kind of, uh, the influence of these different forms of historical writing, and these different moments, and whether uh, if you, would, you would see a need for the recuperation of one or other of them as explanatory mechanisms to accompany theory, or have they, have they been um, made rightfully obsolete? Well, now Tim, you've asked, asked me a question I don't know the answer to. Uh, and, you know, friend, my friend Francesco Garofalo has written an introduction to these essays, which is at the front of the book. And in it, he speculates that the, um, that the essay that the, 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 the essay is the, uh, and I don't think I don't think this is a highly theorized opinion he's expressing. I think it's just a it's just observational that it is his impression that the primary vehicle of theoretical discourse in architecture in the past half century has been the essay, and and, he, and, he, and I think he means also the essay written by. Um, an, an architect who is an intellectual but not necessarily a sculptor, which is how he characterizes me. But he would he would include in that people like like Alan Cahoon and Ignacio de Sola Morales as well as people who also have that similar profile and who and it's probably true that certainly that they are best known for their essays. Um, I I mean I can a small personal complaint. I mean, I, I took too long to write The Space of the Parents, and it came out at the worst possible time because it came out in the kind of absolute heyday of deconstruction. Uh, for, uh, um, um, which would uh, uh, um, have an architectural process with which my book has nothing to do. Um, so, I mean, it was, the timing was my own fault. Um, I can't deny that. But it basically means that book was just the heart of you know, the most work of anything I've ever done uh, in terms of publishing. Um, you know, it got reviewed, it got a half a dozen reviews, and all the reviews that it got were favorable, but um, I think Roger Conover still has a pile of them in his warehouse, and it, it sure wasn't a bestseller. Um, so I, um, and if I think of the things I've written that have had more uh, Effect. I mean, it would be La Vie Masserheim or whatever's the essay, then it would be meaning, which certainly, I mean, if, if the timing of the space of appearance was dead wrong, the timing of meaning and architecture was bang on, right? So it just, everybody was looking for this book, but they didn't know it until the book appeared. So it was very well received. And then some of my essays also have, have been as well, including the one called 
mentality and its discontent. So, so I've certainly had more influence on the basis of my essays. But whether this is a structural phenomenon or not, I, I don't know. And do you do you see a, either a space for or uh, do you miss the the, the these, this other form of the, the Adam's House of Paradise kind of book, the crisis of science, modern science book, that sort of synthetic history? Not you personally, but do you no. think we, we need those? Since we're speaking to an audience of PhD students as well, like, <laughs> they, you know, they, they could choose to write this kind of this kind of work as well. Um. Well, it's an interesting question, and I, what I, the reason I'm hesitating is I was trying to think what was what's the most recent book of that kind I've read that I was really really um, stimulated. I mean, that I thought ch changed my view of the world. And um, I mean, I had read some books recently that yeah, had that effect, but they weren't. Architecture. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm thinking of um, Naomi Klein's Capitalism and Climate Change. That really made me change my view of the world. Um, and another one we had said, this is an old book, and it's actually not unrelated to Naomi Klein, although she doesn't know this. And that is, I, I recently read a really old book, um, which was published in 1944. This is the book of Carl Palenny called The Great Transformation. An astonishing. It's the, it's the best explanation of utilitarianism, the relation of utilitarianism to neoliberalism that I've ever seen. It's just a breathtaking book. So, but what is that? What is that? What's the last architecture book I've read that was like that? Maybe you win this one, I can fall. <laughs> I certainly can't, I can't, no, nothing. Uh, a long, a long, sustained argument architecture book. I guess it would be, I guess it would be Tafuri. Mm -hmm. yeah, I haven't seen any of those since Tafuri, maybe not. I mean, if I, if I have a, a, if something brilliant springs to my mind uh, in the airplane going home, I'll leave it. <laughs> forward that. <laughs> but I didn't mean to cut off any questions. Yeah, we probably have time for a few more. If there, if there aren't any more, there's, there's one more thing I would like to say, especially um, for those of you that I mean, if you were curious enough to come, you might well be curious enough to look more closely at the book. Um, and um, the thing I would say about that is one thing I have always struggled to do is to write um, excessively. I mean, one one of my um, one of my um, irritations with um, uh, post structuralism is just the, the prose style strikes me as so user unfriendly. Um, and actually, lots of lots of philosophical writing is like that. Um, but I, I have, to, um, I really try to. Uh, I don't think you should have to be an architect in order to understand a text of an architecture. And so I've always tried to write for you know, that imaginary reader that is um, um, a, a member of the general public who is intellectually curious and has no more special expertise than that. So, um, and I think the Raffle seems to have made his introduction, he seems to suggest that I've done that with some success, which is set pleasing to me. Well, I would certainly concur, but it seems like, like very much a natural extension of your commitment to, to the public dimension of architecture itself, yeah. whether as a set of objects in the world, Great. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate it.